Welcome to Commander Central, episode 10. Uh, we meant to have Patrick from Commander Time on the show this week, but he had a conflict with his work schedule. Um, he's actually suiting up to quarterback the Packers this week, so I think that'll work out nicely for him. I might um, have to watch football now. <laughs> I, I got to stop you there. I saw this <laughs> meme online of uh, Aaron Rodgers getting sacked by, I do believe it was the Allstate guy, and said <laughs> that if he had Allstate insurance or something like that, it would protect him from mayhem like me. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Episode 10 is brought to us by our new sponsor, Allstate Insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so anything going on this week for you guys? Anything exciting worth talking about? Max is sick and he looks sick. I am sick. But you powered through it and you're here. I think I'm still a little high on NyQuil. So All right. This oh, jeez. Um, I'm going through the wonderful thing called gout again. Oh, jeez. Yep. And everyone's feeling it right now. Once you get the gout, it never goes away. <laughs> no, it does not. And you were up till 2 in the morning playing Commander. Yes, I was. Don't even remind me. <laughs> Playing through three blue decks with a Mardu deck is not fun. Three one view one blue decks. Yes. I have a real quick story. Hopefully it'll be quick. Who knows when I come to tell the story. <laughs> um, so we first I preface by saying I sent a bunch of like junk cards to Card Kingdom this week. Um, like a thousand cards, actually. So when I say a few, it was a thousand cards. Um, for just store credit to buy some stuff, because whatever. And the bulk that was left over stuff that isn't worth anything i had i have like bins of old junk from collections i've bought so i put it on craigslist yesterday like collection of twenty thousand magic cards because it's like twenty thousand cards and i have had people contact me today mostly locally looking wanting to to buy it so that's i'll find somebody but one person contacted me from arizona i don't know how they Whoa. were looking at our craigslist or wow. whatever and and it's like will you ship it to me and I'm like, well, my response was, I just sent a thousand cards to Card Kingdom for trading, and it cost me like fifteen dollars to ship. So this is going to cost me. Like, maybe it doesn't extrapolate out that way, but like, if I multiply it by twenty, it's going to cost me three hundred dollars to get it to you. And the, the, you know, thinking that would be the end of the conversation, and the guy's response was, no, that's fine. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. It may be fine for you, but it's not fine for me for this hundred dollars in cards. I'm not going to pay three hundred dollars shipping to get it to well, you. Well, if he's going to pay shipping, then I would be all he, over that it. That was not part of that. Yeah, he okay. was not volunteering. <laughs> he just was like, yeah, go ahead, man, send it to me. I'm like, no, that's not how it's going to work. So I've got a guy looking at it tomorrow. How about games we played this week? Max didn't play because he was sick, but Chris, as we mentioned, was there late last night. Yeah, I ended up playing. Uh... Your Edgar Markov deck for almost four hours against a 1v1 Geist of St. Traft, a 1v1 Prime Speaker Zagana, and I don't even know what the other kid was running, but it was there was like nine extra turn spells <laughs> in his deck. But not enough to win, clearly, because you guys spent four hours in one game? Yes, almost four hours, and I sat at six life for almost two and a half hours. What? How is that possible? Uh, once the blue deck's online, they just are bouncing threats everywhere and then recurring their bounce spells. And So you just kind of were a passenger at that point. Yep, pretty much. Now, you played my Edric deck, the fact that you guys play more than, than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so what was your opening move, turn one play with my Edric deck? Okay, turn one, I went Chrome Mox, getting rid of uh, Botanical Sanctum, so it creates blue or green. Played uh, Command Tower and Lotus Petal, and played Edric on turn one. So turn one, what? Edric, that is awesome. And, and then what was the response on that? Uh, turn right? one, Swords to Plowshares. <laughs> <laughs> and he did win the game eventually. But yes. Uh, when you go Nictorious Throng with 11 fairies into a uh, biomass mutation for 29, it just <laughs> they pretty much just scoop it up. Turn one, Edric, is fantastic. I, I've never managed to do that in a deck, so that's awesome. The only reason I kept the hand, the rest of the hand was garbage. <laughs> it's worth it from that. It's worth it. Just losing the game, just casting that is worth it, no matter what happens at that point. Well, the way I looked at it, the you know the pros and cons of it was if he doesn't get killed, I'm just going to draw into more lands and other things to do. So Sure. Um, I played like six games. They were all pretty good. Um, I lost to a life swap um, Vona Butcher of Magan deck. So that's the first commander I've played against out of the, the new set. Um it was a pretty cool deck. A lot of like Necropodents that I'm going to draw, you know, 27 cards to get to one life and then cast Axis of Mortality kind of things. <laughs> um, our friend Blake dug out an old deck of his he hadn't played for a while. It was this Ojitai deck. Nice. I don't um, think I've ever played against that one. I didn't even know. I didn't even remember it. Once you brought it out, I was like, oh, I think I recall. But he's like, yeah, I made a few tweaks today, put some new cards in because I hadn't touched it in forever. And he, he cast like a turn 
six or seven, whenever it was, uh, Approach of the Second Sun. Oh, no. And, and with, with not a very good board state. <laughs> and it was immediately like everyone just like turns <laughs> and just starts swinging, like regardless of the board state. And he's like, oh, I can't handle this kind of heat. <laughs> so he got killed before he could. And he almost still got to it, but he didn't. He got killed before he could get to it. So that was interesting to see, like, oh, Approach of the Second Sun and Commander. It's a whole different deal with three people swinging at you once you've cast it once than it is when one person swinging at you. Yep. You definitely need a way to cast it. Get it right away and cast it again. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of you mana. You can't just hope that in a couple turns I'll get back to it. Right. So th- that was kind of funny to see. That's why you got to cast it and then remand it back to your hand and be like, I right. guess what sucker is <laughs> <Right>. my next <laughs> turn? Um, anything interest? Anything we learned this week? Any magic lessons anyone picked up? The the one I it wasn't me, but I saw somebody do it and I'm like, oh, I've done that before. Um, we had one player who was playing uh, Edgar Markov deck was me. And he'd kicked off a ton of tokens, and it was getting out of control. Um, and so everyone's like, oh, someone needs to find a board to wipe. And the guy to my left is like, I'll, I've got a tutor. I can get one. Gets his turn, tutors up, digs through his library, pulls it back to his hand. Okay. It's like, oh, man, I don't have the right man. <laughs> he went and, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he went and got, um, what is the, the new fa- uh, hour of the white one that's like uh, a Chroma's Vengeance, but... Hour of Revelation? Is it Hour of Revelation? I think it is. That winds up that you can cast for three if everyone has X amount of creatures. So his plan was to cast Hour of Revelation and still have mana free to rebuild his board states. That's, yep. why he, that's why he went for that one. He's like, I don't have three white mana. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Yikes. And I'm like, I've done, not like that specific thing, but like I've done that before where you're like, you get so excited by step one, you don't pay attention to the most important part. I think the biggest thing I learned was while playing your Egger deck, I was sitting on about 12 or 15 tokens plus a couple of other guys, and I had um, Vault of the Archangel out. And I wasn't attacking for one sole purpose of the guy next to me had that stupid fish, the reform that turns yes. into a fish, that turns into a whale, that yep. turns into a kraken or whatever. And he had the six sixes out. Yes, I could kill him, but they become nine nines. Right. But I was also at six life. And honestly, I think if I would have swung his way, because he wasn't being very aggressive, I would have gained all that life back. I probably could have turned the game around in my favor. I've always had really good luck with Vault. I mean, you don't use it that often, but like when you use it, it usually changes the state of the game. I always forget about it when my opponents have it, and I'll it happen- swing into it and get my guys go away. That happened to me last night where I um, had two tokens and somebody swung at me. And it, would, and it had been mentioned when I cat when I played it, too. So I was like, oh, Vault, nice. So I, was, I didn't even feel bad about it. It wasn't like it was hidden. It was there and it had been mentioned. And the person swung at me, I don't even remember who it was, with like a commander and something else into two tokens thinking... Killed my tokens, and I was like, oh, I'm going to activate yeah. Vault and gain two life. And I did learn back. when you're behind on board to a person, if you can make allies, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, during that same Edgar game, I had the flipped enchantment. Um, Legion's Landing? Yep, I don't remember what it's called when it flips. But the guy next to me who was playing um, a Geist had a uh, Soul Warden out. So I just looked at him like, okay, I'll make a token. You gain a life. You don't attack me, right? And he's like, no, just keep doing it. So I just kept making tokens, and he kept gaining life, and we just kind of sat back. He had the life to take it, and I had the blockers to block everything that came in. <laughs> I found Legion Landing is really easy to flip. And the um, actually, most of them have been so far, at least that I've played. I've got that out a couple of times, and it's flipped almost instantaneously. Um, the Maze of Ith one flips regular, relatively easily, too. And both times I've had the one that lets you double your spell, which is whose name I've now forgotten. Is that the thematic compass? That lets you, or is that the land one? I confuse the two. Primal amulet and thematic compass. I think amulet flips into Whoops. land that doubles your spell, and I think compass is one that flips into the maze of death. Yep. Yeah. Um, and both of those have flipped very easily. I haven't managed to get out Ikea's cradle yet, but the now other do one, either of you run the the dagger or whatever that flips into the lotus veil or the? I have one coming for Dramoka. Okay, I was wondering if either of you played it and how easy it is to flip it. Um, what is it, What are the triggers in? Is that a three? Uh, it's a two-cost equipment, two to equip. You get plus ah, two, plus right. one, and when the creature deals combat damage, it flips. I so was going to put it in my Sphinx deck, and I haven't yeah. yet. Okay. And that was my thinking. Dramoka, Flyers. Yeah. It pumps Dramoka. Good idea. Yep. And then the blockers you don't care, particularly it's, it's double duty. It's easy for you to get through in the Dromoka deck, now, does this and the say, blockers you don't care about. Does right. it say combat damage, or does it just say damage? Deals combat damage to oh, a player. I was hoping I could cheat that. <laughs> so you can't cheat it with like a niv Mesut or something. It yeah, to, that would be awesome. Yeah. I'd put on like a one of those pyromancers that you just tap and go, ping, oh, guess <laughs> what, land ramp. 
Well, I, I lost a game also from not reading a card carefully enough against that Vona Life Swap deck at one point. He had played a Karma and then had an Urborg out. So Karma deals damage during your upkeep for each swamp you control. Yep. So at that point, everyone's got like 10 swamps. Um, but um, the guy who played it, Lucas, had a Phyrexian on Life out because this is Life Swap deck he mm -hmm. was playing. So Phyrexian on Life, for those who don't know, you can't, you don't die from having zero life once you're below one you take you get poison counters for each yep. life you lose so it'll buy you a couple turns um when his life swap deck he was his plan was just with herb out everyone's at you know 10 15 swamps whatever it was karma will kill everybody well i played gideon um of the trials okay and his plus one is target permanent doesn't deal damage until your next turn i was reading it like my whole plan was oh Okay, well, I'll just use that in his karma. I won't do damage to me. I thought it was target permanent. Doesn't do damage to you until your next turn. So I'm like, I'll just leave the karma up. I don't care, because um, I had a Karn in hand, so I could have oh. killed. I could have killed the karma or his Urborg, or I guess not his Urborg, but I could have killed the karma for sure. And I didn't, because I'm like, oh, then I'll play Gideon. I'll be fine. So I played the Karn, killed something else. I think I killed his fraction on life, because yeah, my plan was to let him die to the karma, and everyone else. And I played Gideon, and I'm like, oh, man, oh, I'm a dummy. So <laughs> pay attention and read your cards, kids. Um, any news this week, Max? We did have a banned and restricted announcement, and nothing got banned or restricted. So very, very exciting. Yeah. Yep. The, the exciting part of that is, though, the Wizards did hint at they are looking at modern more intensely for the banned and restricted, and they look to maybe make changes after Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. Splinter Twin. Please. <laughs> and I've heard the guesses of Stoneforge. And yep. I would love Splinter Twin because it makes it real easy going to a tournament because you go, okay, 50% of the field is playing Splinter Twin, so I know right. how to build my deck <laughs> to beat it. I wonder if that and that's probably the reason I would think they might not unban Splinter Twin because it just was such a prevalent card when it was legal. But it wasn't a hard deck to beat. That's no, why yeah. I was so confused when they banned it. Um, there was also, they also confirmed that we will get double face cards in rivals. In rivals. They're, not, they're not even called double face. What is the technical? They have a transform. Transform cards. Yeah. Double face cards are Kamigawa. Yep. Not that it matters, but um, any social media this week, Chris? Um, yes, we heard from, now I'm going to try and pronounce your name <laughs> right. Uh, ben Fo Fogarty. Am I I'm pronouncing so that I'm right? It's Fogarty, like John Fogarty okay. from CCR. Yep. He uh, had to uh, announce to us that uh, we uh, might have misplaced who we announced that uh, we we're talking about a hacking deck for. And, so. and, and might have, I mean, definitely. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yep. Our fault. Yep. I admit I'm kind of disappointed it's Ben Fogarty and not Finn Bogarty because Finn Bogarty absolutely sounds like a planeswalker. So I, I read all your tweets, and you didn't explain why your name switched like that. I really want to know. I'm assuming it's just like a Twitter goofy thing where yep. you, people switch their names okay. around. Makes sense. <laughs> but yeah, Finn Bogarty is absolutely a planeswalker name. <laughs> <laughs> um so he he sent us in a couple weeks ago because we had mentioned just kind of casually you know you could use hack end uh stromgold scourge as a knight tribal leader because he actually interacts with knights and he actually has a knight deck that he sent us so we said we'd actually take a closer look at it and we did so ben fogarty aka at sparrowhawk that's h-a-w-c-k on twitter um we spent a little few minutes looking at your deck and we're going to talk about it here a little bit um so first off, I'm going to mention, unless I'm missing something, um, Hacken is mostly for flavor of the challenge. I mean, not that he's not good, like there's some cool synergies there, but man, I'm not, is it, is it worth the, the hoops to jump through? I guess once you jump through him, it's really good. Like once you have him yeah. out and in play, you can do a lot of cool stuff. Yep. Yeah, if he's in play in it, that enchantment or that artifacts in play where you change your creature types, you can just go bonkers with all the, uh, you, like, right. the so mana doubler type things he has in there. Is that a creature from Kamigawa, or a tar an artifact from Kamigawa, I forget the name of it, um, where all creatures in your hand, graveyard... I think it's hand, deck, and graveyard become the creature type of the chosen type. And that's Ashes of the Fallen. There we go. Artifact, right? Yep. So if you have Hakan out and you have Hakan Hakan, however, you're pronounced, however it gets pronounced, that's just bonkers at that point. Yep. So I guess it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Do you want something that you can consistently have out, or do you want to go for that home run? The home run's probably more fun, I would imagine, I guess. Like, when you actually pull off all of the pieces and get it out, that's probably just fantastic to play. Yes. But then I did look through the deck, and the rest of the deck is a regular Black Sack out Outlet deck. So if yeah. he does get stopped with the Hacken, um, seems like the deck will still play. Yes. 
Although it's man, great grave hate would really be brutal. Oh, it would be. I'm not gonna like dig too deep into deck tech things. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how. The one thing that jumped out at me, uh, he's got a Crypt Ghast, uh, Magus of the Coffers, Cabal Coffers, uh, Narcana Revenant. Um, there's no Gauntlet or Cage Sun or Extra Pointer Lands, but that's still four mana doublers, despite having an Urborg in the deck, which I guess is pretty useful. Um, there's a lot of non basics. I don't know which ones I would pull necessarily, but like that really sucks when you have a mana doubler out and half your lands are that is true are not swamps or something. Um, I remember when I had my mono black drain a deck. I remember trying to find that was that was a pain in the butt to balance. Like you wanted cool um, lands that had utility, but I also wanted swamps out because if pretty frequently they could tap a swamp for three or four mana. Yep, um, and Urborg does fix that a little bit, but. Um, it's, it, you can't always guarantee you have Urborg out. Although looking at it, like I don't know what lands I would pull necessarily because they're all useful. Though the one thing I thought there is two fetch lands in there, and I'll put this in the show notes on the website. I, I found an article a few years ago from a guy who did like all the crazy math about whether fetch lands are worth it to thin your deck, and it's like ridiculously complicated. He has all these bar graphs and stuff showing that it's not. So if you're just running fetch lands to thin your deck out, it doesn't really work in Commander. No, fetch lands, in my opinion, for commander are only to keep you on your color curve. Well, or sometimes too, sometimes you need the shuffle. Yes, so, I can see that. So too. maybe if you're planning on running a lot of like a lot of stuff that's they play in the top card of your library, and you want to like get rid of it, that makes sense too. But I didn't see anything in there that led me to believe that was necessarily the case. On the other hand, it's not like those are real utility lands. Like a, a marsh flats is a swamp. If you're just getting a yep. swamp for it, it's not like that sucks up a, a utility land slot too. So. I don't know if that matters either. Um, I like the nameless inversion. That's clever <laughs> because, it's a, because it's a changeling spell, so you can recast it with hack, and that's cool. Uh, Black market is one of those spells that, when it's out and it works, um, it's awesome. It's b- just ridiculously broken. But there's so many times you're like, I just don't want to cast this right now because it's five mana. And looking at the board state, you're like, I'm just. It's a time walk. I'm gonna time walk myself. I'm just going to do nothing this turn casting this black market and hope that some stuff dies. Yep, I can see it because um, I noticed there was no Exsanguinate, no Torment of Hailfire. Right. But if you were playing those cards with it, with all the mana doubling creatures and the Cabal Coffers, plus black market with all your sack outlets, you could potentially, if everything goes on curve, torment out the game within five or ten turns. Yeah, yeah. easily. Yes. Um, but, then, but then it's kind of a different deck than you're looking at. Like At that point, you're definitely probably going to go to Water Run Drana because yep. then you can also just one-shot somebody with her. Yep. I also tend to think Hatred probably should be in most mono-black decks. It's so easy to just kill, like, particularly like late game. You draw that, and you're like, I've got more life than you, you're dead. Yep. If yep. you can get through with the creature, you can And just you always kill target somebody. out the, the biggest threat on the board. If you can kill him, kill yeah. him off, and then you can sit back with five or ten life and be like, okay, the rest of you I'm not too worried about. But I also didn't see a lot of obvious holes for it either. So I, I'm not, there's like, this card's definitely bad, and this one, um, Crucible maybe is a little bit forced in there, although you, you need, need it to get back. To do the hack and stuff. Yeah. Yep. yep. So um, I did think Null Profusion was kind of clever too because it lets you, force you to discard down to two cards. So if you're trying to get hack on in your graveyard once it's in your hand, that's also a, a good trick. So uh, it was uh, Behold the Beyond. I didn't even know that card existed. I did, and my first thought was, I saw, was when I saw it, I'm like, well, it's not as good as Diabolic Revelation. I mean, it's a wash, right. but because it, it, it forced you to discard your hand, except for in this case, he probably wants his hand discarded, so right. it makes sense here. Um, I got to say, the one card that I found kind of lost on was, I don't remember the name of the artifact that where you skip your discard face. All players skip their discard face. I honestly didn't see that in there. Anvil of Bogarden. I think that's oh, yeah. what it was was in there. But don't you get an extra draw? During brand? each player's draw phase, that player draws an additional card and then chooses and discards a card. So let's see, it's also a way to get okay. in the graveyard. Yep. Um, and it ramps you a little bit too. So yep. So there we go. There's our like little mini deck tech. I like the deck actually. Um, so did I. I thought it was quite interesting because yeah. they'll see Hack and they're like, oh, okay, this is what he's going to do. And then all of a sudden you're just like, <laughs> surprise, guess what? I'm not going to do it this game. There's not a bunch of knights in my deck. <laughs> um it is a challenge, and it's unique, and that's those are all interesting things to see as well. So, um, All right, moving on. And thank you very much for sending us a deck, by the way. And if anyone else has something cool, we'll take a look at it. If you guys do have a deck, you can send it to us on Twitter, at CMDR Central, or you can find us on Facebook, search us up Commander Central, or find us online at www.commandercentral.com. 
And the one final bit of news we have is we have a Patreon up and running. Uh, you can find us on patreon.com slash CMDR Central. All right, excellent. Um, yeah, send us your decks. We'll take a look at them, and we can see if there's any any pet cards of yours in your list, because we're here to talk about our pet cards today. Meow. Um, <laughs> right. Oh, like, nice. <laughs> Every time we mention a card, you're going to have to do that sound. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I don't know if I can <laughs> replicate it. So by pet cards, we mean cards that like you like in a deck that you think are useful, that you think that play well, that other people generally don't or aren't running for whatever reason. Um, doesn't mean they're like that strong, but they might be. Maybe they are great. Maybe they're cards you just like um, that find a hole in your deck, that just find a slot in your deck. Because it's been my experience that most people have one or two of these cards that they kind of put in their deck that's their baby. Um, so let's talk about a few of them here to get some ideas. Um, Max, do you want to start us out with here? I do. I'm going to start with Tamio's Journal. That was the, like the, the one card I knew you were going to mention yep. for sure. Uh, for those who don't know, it is a five drop artifact from Shadows Over in Estrad. And it says at the beginning of, y- of your upkeep, investigate, which means you get the colorless clue artifact with two, sack it, draw a card. It also has tap, sacrifice three clues, search your library for a card and put it into your hand and shuffle. Uh, the reason I like this card is in the deck I run it in, which is my Dromoka deck, it offers more draw either right away by getting that clue and paying the two mana for it, or letting them stack up for the tutor, or even letting them stack up for long game draw engine where people would most rather blow up the journal than the individual clues. Uh, Tamu's journal is in 4,764 decks on EDH rec, most of which wow. are... Are, uh, are decks that sacrifice artifacts. So Brea, Doretti, um, Fettergang Brothers, um, Sidri, I guess, who just interacts with artifacts. Um, so it's 4,000. I was kind of surprised it was that high because I don't see it get played that much. Played that much, excuse me. Um, what did shock me is it's not in very many Boros decks or Mono White decks. And man, I feel like just the ability to draw for two mana every turn is such a useful effect. Even if you're not using it for the tutor ability, um, in those colors that are so desperate for draw, I'm just I was shocked it wasn't in more Boros decks. I could see that, but I think most people when they build Boros, they build it as a heavy aggro, and they don't yeah, like sure. wasting turn five to drop an artifact that's doing nothing for them. And it the is point. five mana; that's not nothing. I don't know. I, it's a, but it's a really useful card too. And one thing too, it, it, the the clues get just made automatically. You don't have to do anything. Yep. And then you can when you tap it to sacrifice the clues, but you can do it the same turn. So like it doesn't. You're not making the choice between making a clue and sacking it to do the tutor. You do the same thing on the same turn. Yeah, and notice my big fault with that card is I forget the clues are out there. And then all of a sudden it's like, then they go the one turn, sack them all and go tutoring. And you're like, okay, I won't remember or won't forget it next time. It's also the kind of thing where people aren't going to remove it, at least until you get a few clues down. Like if you are, if you just want to draw and never want a tutor, people for the most part are not going to target your Tamios journal. It's one of those cards that's productive, but it's also safe Yep. in a way. If, if you play a Phyrexian Arena, unless there's something ending the world on board, people are going to remove your arena. Yeah. Or if you play a Rhystic Study. Um, this is a card that, like, until they're like, oh, man, he's got two artifacts out, and I know he's in a tutor for some huge thing. They might hit it then. But if you're like, I just want to make sure I can make a clue every turn and draw an extra card, and you're sacking them so you're never a threat, it'll sit there all game. The reason I like this over a card like Mind's Eye is although... On turn five, you're probably spending all your mana to cast either one of these. The clues build up over time where the Mind's Eye, you have to do it on demand. Right. The clues, you, you can use them whenever you want to use them. Right. And Mind's Eye, you have to have mana free. Yep. I like Mind's Eye too, but um, this is easier and safer, and there's a lot of deck archetypes where this works better. If you're playing like a draw-go kind of white-blue style deck where you want to save your mana, well, you can save your mana until the end of the turn and then sack two clues to draw two cards. So I just thought of something. I'm going to do a shout out to Frank. What do you think about this in his token deck with all his token doublers? Because uh-huh. it is a token, yep. so, so it would be make... doubled. Yeah, I would think. I don't know how. I don't know if it'll work with this. Parallel Lives just say token or does it say creature token? Look that up right now while I'm talking. Because I'm pretty sure doubling season would hit it. I think it would be fun to do just to. I th- I'm pretty sure doubling season would. Parallel Lives also hits it. If an effect would put one or more tokens onto the battlefield under your control, it puts twice as many. Nice. Just, I'm thinking um, of any token double generator. I think it'd be generator. fun. Sure, that would yeah. be fun in there. Just mm. so you get extra card draw off. Of Isn't that. there that one from Shadows that doubles a type of token you control too? Yep. Yeah. Um, second Harvest, I believe. All right. Chris, what do you have for us? Well, let's start off with a card that Dana loves. 
with a passion. It's called the Treasure Cruise. We, I, ha- we have an eight mana sorcery speed, draw three cards. But the upside is you can delve away cards to make it a one mana, draw three cards. Now, let me quick say, I, Treasure Cruise is a great card, and, and I absolutely <laughs> recognize that. Um, the one deck I ran in it was my Sphinx, my Asphyria Sphinx Tribal deck that has a rest in peace, and it just doesn't put a lot of stuff in the yard anyway. And literally, I never drew it when there was stuff to delve away. Like there were multiple games in a row where I cast it for the full for the full cost <laughs> to the point where I'm finally like I'm done I'm done even messing around with this I can't remember what I replaced it with but I'm like I'm not paying seven mana to hard to to draw three cards that's ridiculous yeah I went through the same thing with Brago when I I could delve stuff away but it was the stuff that I needed to walk out sure. the game so it was a waste of a spot but anyway that's not a reflection of the card that's just like the deck I was yes. playing right. really frustrated me whenever I drew it See, I really like the card I just find it like a dual utility. I mean, if you can get it for one mana for three cards, it's probably one of the best ones that you could use. Oh, absolutely. But then you run into this situation like what you were talking about. But most of my blue decks, I'm not running Rest in Peace or anything in it. Right. Or I need to bring stuff back from the graveyard. It's just like all all that stuff's garbage. Get rid of it. And there are some situations, like if you're talking about um, um, who's the, the, the Delve guy... Uh, Tassiger? Tassiger, where you want to have the ability to sculpt your graveyard and get some stuff out of there. Yep. Yep. To limit your opponent's choices. So there are some decks where that's that's a bonus. So it's not just like a way to make it cheap. That's make it a way to make it cheap while simultaneously helping out your commander and your game plan. Um so yeah, it's a really, really good card. I think it's people re- it's recognized for its power during the, you know, however long it was legal and modern before they're like, Whoa, yep, this it's was banned in modern, idea. banned in one v one commander restricted i think it's restricted in legacy was it much of a player in standard i don't remember i'm sure it was played yes but it wasn't, no but it wasn't like format breaking like it no. was dig through time was played much more because yeah. of the dig for seven and take two it's actually banned in legacy and restricted oh it is in banned in legacy restricted in vintage oh, i don't play a whole lot of legacy but i agree it does kind of slip between the cracks and commander for sure yep what about you dana first one i'm going to mention is righteous war uh, Righteous War is a two mana, excuse me, a three mana enchantment out of Visions. Um, costs a white, a black, and a colorless. And it just says all white creatures you control gain protection from black, and all black creatures you control gain protection from white. Um, it's in 112 decks on EDH Rec. I'm one of them. That's yes. not a whole lot I'm of them. Two of them. So right here, we're, we're taking up like. So it's 109 decks. Of the decks. <laughs> yeah. So there's a little story behind this. Um, I had put together a um, Uncle Carl deck, Karlov deck, that eventually became my Tesa deck. But I built it about the same time that our friend Luke had built a Animar Morphs deck. So the first night I had Karlov out, he brought his Morphs deck and was trying it out. And he's like, I'm going to play Animar all night because I want to get used to it. All right. So I sat down and played Uncle Carl. We start playing. And Animar gets out and gets like three or four counters on it. And I'm like, oh, well, shoot, I can't kill Animar. I've got a Path Exile in my hand, but Animar has protection from black and protection from white. I'm like, oh man, okay. So something else happened and he's like, okay, I'm going to swing at you with Animar who's like an, you know, 1919 or something dumb. And I'm like, I can't block with anything because I'm playing a white black deck and he has pro black white. I'm like, all right. So I died eventually. And then, but I don't think he even won, but it was just like, oh, that's really annoying to deal with with this particular deck. So he kept playing Animar. He's like, I'm going to do one more game with Animar. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to switch decks. I don't want to deal with it with that uncle carl deck so i grabbed my glissa deck that's black too <laughs> i didn't think about it i was just like well, I'm, not, I'm not playing a black white deck i'm just gonna play play glissa so he he played he was playing morphs and getting a bunch of counters on on animar again and i'm like oh i need to kill animar so i i had a tutor so i dug through my library i'm like i'm gonna grab a tutor i'm like well Okay, Hero's Downfall doesn't work. Putrefy doesn't work. Maelstrom, Maelstrom Pulse doesn't work. I'm like, oh, Beast Within. Grabbed it, cast it, killed Animar. Well, three turns later, he's back again. I'm like, and I'm done. I have no <laughs> yep. removal now. Executioner's Castle doesn't work. I'm like, if Animar, so my, my commander can't block. Most of my creatures can't block. So I, I went through and looked a little bit today then in, in thinking about that, just to show you some stats. Um, the top 10 targeted removal spells in EDH Rec, um, Swords to Plowshares, Putrefy, Path, um, Anguish on Making, Beast Within, Utter End, Terminate, Mortify, Chaos Warp, and Hero's Downfall. Eight of those ten spells 
Or black or white. Or black or white. Yep. So if you have a black or white commander and you play Righteous War, eight of the top ten most frequently played spells don't work. And if you go 20 deep from 11 to 20, Ponjify and Rapid Hydratization are the only two that work there. So four in the top 20 work. That's I'm gross. surprised not more people are playing Reality Shift then. That should be in there in that um, list. I'm guessing because it wasn't quite new enough, but I, okay. I kind of am too over it because Anguish on Making is new. Yep. So I, I kind of am too. Um, three of the top five most popular commanders of all time are black and white. <laughs> really? So that means if you're playing it, you're just protected against their commanders. If you are playing a, a commander that's protected, three of the top most frequently played commanders, um, f- in five of the top ten have black and white. So half of the t- ten most frequently played commanders, you're just immune to. They can't block any of your cre- they can't block any of your creatures at that point. Um. So anyway, after playing an Animar deck, then I remember that card, and I, that, I kind of did the mental math, and I'm like, that's super annoying. Not that Animar is not good, but like the ability to not deal with Animar is so powerful. So I put that Righteous War in my Tasa deck and played with it, and it's been great. It is a pretty good card. I, I enjoy seeing it come out. It doesn't really worry me too much, because usually my decks have some other color, so I don't and have you to worry to about run, it too much. You, you have red deck and green yep. decks. And, but like, there's always, there, I, there's, I guarantee you there's one person in every four-player pod when I play Righteous War who's screwed. Yep. Because I remember doing it, playing it in my Edgar deck against you um, and against your Lycia deck, and you're like, well, I can, nothing I can do now. Mm-hmm. You can't block any of my creatures. You can't interact with my commander at all. So it's just a deck. It, it's, a, it's a card that if, you're, if your commander's white and black, it's fantastic. I don't get why it's not in every Kalia deck. Right. I it mean, should be. Yeah. I never thought about that either. I've never seen it come out of a Kalia deck. Yeah, I never have either. Now maybe, but, I understand if, if you like are playing auras and you don't, well, obviously then you can't attach an aura to your commander if they have pro-white and you're playing a white aura or something. There's reasons you maybe wouldn't, but I don't see many auras in Kalia, Kalia decks. No. Now, technically, Righteous Ward's on the reserve list, but it's still, it's 68 cents as of today you can buy it for on TCG Player. Yeah, I think it's because it's such a, a limited field type of card because you have to be in black and yeah, white black to play and white. it. So, but um, if, if you want one, you can get them, even though it's on the reserve list. Don't be scared away. It's it's cheap. Just don't and buy them I out. I like it a lot. Please don't, don't buy, buy them don't, out. Right. <laughs> I was just going to say, how much do we have to pitch in together to buy it out? <laughs> I'm sitting here doing the math. I actually, when the four color commanders came out, or that, like when they were being announced, I'm like, oh, a bunch of these. Okay, so a lot of these guys are going to be black and white. So people might want Righteous War. So I picked up a bunch of them. I have like 20 at home. I'm like, oh, you know, it'll go up. Of course, it hasn't at all. It's still at 68 cents. It was at 68 cents <laughs> two years ago, and it's still there. So that's my great financial spec for you. All right, Righteous War. Max, what do you got for us next? My next one is Eerie Interlude or Ghostway. So they do very similar things. They're instants that let you exile target creatures you control and bring them back. So, so why do you like those so much? Well, I first ran Ghostway. I first discovered Ghostway for Brago. So you're using an Umbrago just as like a blink enabler to... Because ET- all your creatures have ETB abilities. Right. So as a way to double up on your ETBs, in addition to playing it and Bragoing it, you now have a third way. Exactly. But then I've now come to realize they protect against wrath or bounce spells that in colors that I don't have counter spells in. So I play one, I play Eerie Interlude in Dromoka. And it has come in handy when someone rasps the board. Oh, it screwed me a bunch of times when I've thought I've been safe yep. with the board wipe when you play your inter- interlude. And then everyone else loses their stuff. So your board state is already good. All I've succeeded in doing is making it better because everyone else's stuff dies to the board wipe and your stuff is fine. Yep. yep. Now, don't confuse these with the other ones that blink immediately. These come back at end of yes. turn. Yes, yep. they do. Because if they came back immediately, they'd still die to the, to the rat. Yep. Exactly. So it's they're nice because they're offensive and defensive. You can use them to proc... ETBs if you need to, or you can use them defensively. Because the problem with a lot of the defensive cards, like, say, Rootborn Defenses, for example, that, that gives your creatures indestructible, which is a good defense against a board wipe, well, you can't really use that offensively. I and mean, you can if you're swinging in wildly and you want to make sure your creatures don't die, but it's pretty much something you use to it's for an anti-board wipe tech. Whereas here, if you're saving your mana free for an eerie interlude or something, well, you, can, you can also use it to proc abilities if you need yep. to. Correct. The The difference that I like between the two is Ghostway hits everything, all your creatures. You, you can't choose. It just you hits can't them choose. all. Eerie Interlude, you get to pick the target. So if I do have something that I actually want to die because of a graveyard trigger or something like that, that's kind of the, where I run one over the other. And those are also both... Uh, Ghostway had gotten up to like 8 or $9, I think. But it's Eerie Interlude being such a close copy that came out yep. in 
in Shadows of Innistrad has knocked that price back down too. So those are both uh, definitely um, your inner was under three, I think. And last I checked, Ghost Lady was five or six. It's under a dollar, Eerie Interlude, yeah. So those are also they're cheap and easy to get, and probably should be in more decks. I mean, a token deck isn't a great place for them because nope. tokens don't come back. But there's a lot of situations where those are really useful cards. Yeah, if you're gonna do it in tokens, you're better off playing Teferi's Bathroom yeah. Break. So right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I heard so. I mean, it was you. I heard somebody call it Teferi's Bathroom Break last night. I'm yeah, sure. I did. And, you? and the one guy who was talking about it, he looks at me. He's like, "That is a good call. I'm gonna get this card <laughs> altered so it shows Teferi sitting in the bathroom with a newspaper." <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Uh, Chris, what do you got for us? Uh, my next one that uh, not a whole lot of people I've ever seen play too much is uh, Chandra Pyromaster. Uh, she's a four drop from your uh, Magic like 2015, 2014 sets. Comes in with four loyalty. Her plus one, she deals one damage to target player and one damage to target creature that player controls. That creature can't block this turn. Her minus seven is exile the top ten cards of your library. Choose an instant or sorcery card exile this way and copy it three times. You may cast the copies without paying their mana costs. Now those are all fine and dandy. I run her for her zero. Which says, exile the top card of your library, you may play it this turn. So her zero is the impulse r- impulse draw spell that Red, Red yes. now has. And this is the first good Chandra. I mean, not the other ones were, a couple of the other ones were semi-playable, but like this was the first one that was good. Yeah, In my opinion, I agree with she's that. She's not as good as the one from uh, Kaladesh. Yep. But she's still quite good. Yep. Um, I just like her, just for that, I mean, if playing in red, I want to hit my land drops repeatedly. I want to be able to not burn out my hand, and if I can cast stuff off the top of my deck, awesome. What I do like is, I mean, that's, isn't that the same mana cost as Outpost Siege? It is completely the same mana yep. cost, but she has different functions, so if people yep. just ignore like an Outpost Siege, you can do other things with her exactly. if need be. And she's in less than 2,000 decks on EDH Rag. Um, and they're all in the, the main one is number one is Narset, which is probably just for Narset Super Friends. And number two is Chandra Roaring Flame, where she's probably in it just because it's a Sh- there's pr- Chandra. There's probably a lot of Chandra decks. Yep. So she's not in that many decks. The the number three is Rakdos Lord of Riots, where it's probably mostly for her plus, plus ability one. to do damage to everybody to and play to, Rakdos. To play Rakdos. And that's only 56 Rakdos decks. He's the he, Rakdos decks. He's number three. So she's just not in very many decks. Yep. I just. I mean, come on, man. Red, you need as many options you as do. you can. Yeah. Well, and I played a game last night against a Neheb deck, um, and he was running Hulling Mine and it was a Temple Bell, I think, um, for draw. And it, it screwed him. Like, he he couldn't do as much with his one card as everyone else was doing with their card. Not that there aren't – there are times when those are perfectly fine draw options, but, like, Shano's just getting you the card. Yes, I know um, I played against him, too, last night with that deck, and he Howling Mind, and I ended up playing Alhammer. It's Archive. And then just left the Howling man, Mind alone going, yeah, yeah, you guys care. get two, I get four, whatsoever. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so very cool. So we'll go to my next one here, which is Homeward Path. Uh, hate that card. <laughs> really? Now, why do you hate it? Because you forget it's on the field? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always when I play Bribery, too. So that's actually in my notes. So for those who don't know, Homer Path is a land. You can tap it for a colorless mana, or you can tap it, and each player gains control of all creatures he or she controls. He or she owns, excuse me. Um, now, it's in 16,000 decks, which I was surprised at. Um, but the three most popular commanders that it's in are the three pre-con decks that it came in. Really? It was in the first commander set. It was in C13, and it was in C16. Um, so it's in the th- whatever those three were. I didn't write that part down, but so a lot of people left it in their deck. I think that's probably what has contributed yep. to the numbers being as high as it is. Um, but I don't see it in that many decks. There was just a judge foil of it, which I've tracked a few down. And it's a really good looking card, but it, it shuts down a lot of strategies. And like you said, I've had people straight up bribery a creature from my library with a Homer path sitting there untouched, like untap and they bribery something. I'm like, yeah, that's cool with me. I get a cool big beater. Essentially, Thank you for paying eight mana to get my best card on my deck. Thanks for paying a bunch of mana, losing a card, so I could cast my best creature for one colorless mana, essentially. Yep. Um, that I, doesn't happen that frequently, but it, I mean, it's happened. Yeah, I myself, I only play it in one deck, and I play it in my Ural deck, just in case some stupid <laughs> shenanigans happen with that nine mana, 12 mana, whatever the hell mana that is of that red. I hate this card. This is why I'm being so mad about it. But sometimes that happens, sure. and I'm just yep. want to go, no, give it back. 
Well, there's just so many such a, like it. I mean, if someone has a sack of wood insurrection, it doesn't do any good because I'll still sack your stuff. But that's better than getting hit with it. If someone casts, if someone casts Rise of the Dark Realms, <laughs> bring all your stuff back. Well, hey, thanks. I'll take my stuff back. Yep. Yep. Everyone else gets theirs back too, but that's better than one person having, having it all for the yeah. most part. It, I used it last night. Um, so I'll, I'll quick relay this story. Um, it was against the Edgar, against the Edgar Markov deck, and the guy had a bunch of tokens out, and he had played Captivating Vampire, which is you tap five untapped vampires to gain control of a creature. And I had an, I was playing my Mina and Den deck, and I had played an Uvenwald Hydra, and he took the Hydra first. And he, I had had, had Homer Path out for a couple turns, and he just wasn't paying attention. Now, he had enough tokens that he could take it back, so I don't, I don't know if he didn't see it or wasn't too worried about it, but and it was the right target. He took it, so I came back around to my turn, and I tapped the Homer Path to get it back, and then it didn't matter what he did. I just lamented his fault at then. Okay. Draw, to draw 13 cards and gain 13. Because I think it was a 13-13 at that point. I had ramped enough to draw 13 cards and gain 13 life. And that changed. That got me to a Blasphemous Act, which I could cast for one mana because of all his tokens, and then reset the game. So like without Homer, Homer Path was the only way I got to that point. Because any creature spell I would have taken, he would have, he would have stolen. So I was able to bring my own creature, I, creature back to draw enough cards to get to that act and save the turn. Well, that doesn't happen all the time, but like it happens often enough that it's worth having a slot in your deck, and it still taps for a mana. It doesn't come into play <laughs> tapped. There's just not a lot of downside to Homer Path. I'm curious why he took the Hydra over something else. I think no one else had anything good. Like I think the guy across from me had like a one-one. Um, he was playing a Reese Redeem deck, but I think all he had out was Reese. Now, did you have Mina and Den out at the I, time? I didn't have Mina and Den out. Okay, because if you did, I, that would have been land. my target. I hadn't played Mina and Den yet. And I played the Hydra first because I had the Mentus Fall in hand, and he had a bunch of tokens, and I was planning on doing that. And then he played Captivating, Hy- Captivating Vampire and immediately took the Hydra. So I'm like, oh, there goes that plan to <laughs> draw 13 cards or whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, I'll just Homer Path it back. I like how political that card actually is. You're right. It actually is. I there's been a few times where I face a Karthus Tyrant of Jun deck and they steal my Dromoka or Dromoka the Eternal, and they don't realize I have Homeward Path out till I reorganize my lens and be like, "You can just, swing at me, but I'm just going to get him back. back." Or you can swing at him. Yep. When he's already at right. I love 14, those board states yeah. like that. Fourteen Dromoka damage. Kill him with my commander. Then I'll take him. Then back. we'll figure. Right. Then we'll figure it out. Yeah. For sure. Um, okay, Max, what do you have for us? My last one is Seasons Past. This is <laughs> a recent edition. <laughs> I of the love Arsenal. that card. And this is because of Chris. Chris is the one who showed me this card when he played Leovold. Yep. Oh, I missed that deck. Leovold so bad. Elves. It wasn't even combo Leovold. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a six mana. Sorcery out of shadows over Innistrad, and it says return any number of cards with different CMCs from your graveyard to your hand. Put Seasons Past on the bottom of your graveyard. I run this in Dromoka. It's just a way for me to get all the big beaters out of my graveyard, or even like a land that I need to ramp more. Gets me my ramp spells. People don't really pay attention when I'm sitting there manipulating my graveyard. You know, they just let me do it, and then come my turn, I play Seasons Past, and I bring back 12 cards. When this card first came out, I was I just was dismissive of it because my thought was, well, for a couple more mana, you could just play Praetor's Council and get your whole hand back. You yep. have no maximum hand size. Or you play a couple less and use no Witness or Regrowth or whatever. I felt like it was at the cost for getting, like it, you wanted either to go big or you wanted to go yep. small. It was in between. And I didn't think that was, that's not been the case. Whenever I've seen it played, it's been backbreaking. Yep. The cool thing I like about it is that it goes back to your deck. Yes, it does, too. and I and I've had at least Chris, maybe, and maybe you have too, Max. I've had it played multiple times against me yep. by people before. Yep, I always like playing this with a fetch land in my graveyard because then I can play the fetch and then get that shuffle to get that off the bottom of my library. Yeah, yep. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a sneakily um solid card, and it's also cheap. I mean, it's under a buck, I think. Uh, Chris, anything interesting for you for your last one? Yeah, so Max brought up my Leovold deck, and this is where my last one comes in. It's called called Cadaverous Bloom. Uh, Five mana, three colorless, one black, one green. We're coming out of the Mirage, I do believe. Yep. Yep, Mirage. The nice little palm tree or whatever. That's an enchantment. Choose a card in your hand and remove it from the game. Add double black or double green to your mana pool. Play this ability as a mana source. 
Now, I did this in Leovold to pretty much combo off. Because what I'm doing is I'm just stealing your guys' card draws and have a million cards in my hand, and I'm just going to nuke you out. Sure. And there's no activated cost. To, I mean, there's no mana cost to this. You can just yep. pitch a bunch of cards yep. and gain a bunch of mana. And you can do it at any time. Yep. So and I if mean, you're in a Gitrog monster deck, you can draw a card for the lands that you're pitching to this. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it was just, it's, I find it all around a nice utility. I guess it could be a dangerous card to play. You could actually hurt yourself in the long run. But um, we'll go into Tasker like we were talking before. There's a wonderful card called Torrent Elemental, <laughs> which you pitch to this. Then you can play Torrent Elemental from Exile. Yeah. So you're getting double utility out of it. And Cadaver's Bloom is also on the reserve list, if you're curious. And it's it's a dollar. It's more than Righteous War, but it's not much more than Righteous War. So it's, it's cheap to pick up as well. And in decks that want it, it's really strong. But even if you're just playing black and just, just playing Golgari or some combination, being able to just pitch extra cards to get mana ramp the turn is sometimes pretty useful. Especially if they're just junk cards in your hand. There's a lot of decks where like, just getting the ramp, even if you're not comboing out, is really, really useful. And I, I made the comment before about Gitrog Monster. I guess that wouldn't work there either because you're not. You, 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 it's an exile. It's not a to the graveyard. So ignore that as well. Yep. True. Yeah, you'd want to play uh, Squandered Resources in your Gitrog yeah. deck, yep. which allows you to sack a land to add a colored mana. All right. So we'll go to my last uh, pet card, and that's Overwhelming Intellect. Now this is expensive. It's four mana. F- excuse me. It's four and two blue, so six total mana for an instant. It says counter target creature spell. So only creature spells. However, you then draw cards equal to that spell's converted mana cost. It's in 924 decks on EDH Rec. The way I found it was um, my friend Frank and I were playing one night right when we were getting into Commander, so years ago, we were playing the dual decks. Is it and Golgari had just come out, and I, is it versus Golgari, which I think was Return to Ravnica era, yep. Yep. in the is it deck. Yes, it was. And I had it in my hand, and I'm like, oh, that's a six mana counter, so that's terrible. And it came around to him or whatever it was, and he played like a, like on turn seven, some ridiculous seven drop creature that was in that deck, the little guard deck that was terrible. And I'm Doom like, oh, great. I, 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 I might have been. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember what the creature was, but I'm like, oh. <laughs> you, would, you would know yeah. you're a Ravnica guy. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever it was, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to counter that and draw seven cards. I'm like, oh, this is pretty useful. I was looking at it wrong. It's not a counter spell. It's a, I mean, it is a counter spell. You have to counter something, but like, that's incidental. That's just setting them back for you to draw cards. So once I realized it's a draw spell, I started running in a few of my decks. And I'll give you an example. Last night, I wrote this down. I played um, both of my decks that are running. I played my Talran deck, and I played Isperia. I played three games, um, two with Talran, one with the Sphinxes. Um, so I counted from turn six onward in all three of those games. So because it's six mana, I'll just, I assumed no ramp. Um, Talran went to the first Talran game went to turn 14. So from turn 6 to 14, there was one turn where someone didn't play a creature with CMC 4 or more. Oh, so wow. wow. So in, in all but one of those turns, I would have drawn four cards while countering a spell someone was playing, a, a, a presumably a decent creature, and I would have drawn four or more cards for it. Um, and the second Talran game went to 13 turns, and there were zero turns where someone didn't play a CMC 4 or more creature. And then in my Assyria game, went to turn 19, and there were only two turns without a creature over four mana from six till 19. So in those 13 turns, only two of them didn't have a big creature. And that's ignoring two Eternal Witnesses. I didn't write down anything else, but there was twice someone played Eternal Witnesses. And I'm like, oh, if I had my um, intellect in hand, I would counter the Eternal Witness. Even though it's only three mana, I would for sure counter right. it. Because who cares? It's three cards for six mana, but... I'm, kill- I'm stopping your Eternal Witness from bringing yep. back something awful. You get rid of creature and you get rid of them getting a yeah. card back. So if you're relying on it to stop like a game-ending creature, that's a bad idea. You want a, just a real counter spell for that. But if you draw it and you're like, okay, that person's going to play their commander, so I'm just going to save my mana and treat it as a draw spell that also hits their tempo, it's really, really good. Do, do you have a threshold for how low the CMC of the creature? You Obviously, you're not going to cast down like a Hope of Gear Pour, but... Right. What, I, you said four, Ewit, that's that's half of the cost of overwhelming yeah, intellect. Four was kind of my, I, I had figured six to draw four is reasonable at instant speed, particularly if you're killing a creature. I do believe there is a spell called, con, not concentrate, but there's another one that's six mana, draw four, opportunity. Opportunity yep. is, is draw four at six. Yep. So it's an opportunity at, at four mana. It's That also sucks up their mana and mm-hmm. yep. costs them a card. But it also can scale. Someone drops an Elish Norn, you're going to draw, you know, 
seven or eight cards or someone draw, plays an Eldrazi, you're going to draw 10 cards or 11 cards or something. But even if you had an Eternal Witness at three, that's worth it. Yep, There's plenty of times someone might play a two drop that you're like, oh, that I'm not, I don't want to deal with that, whatever, I can't think of anything on top of my head, but there's there's cards. Burning you, Tree Shaman. Sure, right, maybe, right. Or Emissary, pardon. Yeah. Yep. Or a three mana Fleshbag Marauder if you have one good creature in play, you don't want to deal with that, so you, that's worth the counter. So I don't think it's like a great or broken card, but I never feel bad about drawing it. And I can re- I can distinctly recall games where, in my Tower End deck in particular, um, where I've been behind, like someone's board wiped two or three times, I didn't have a counter spell, and I'm out of can trips to get back into the game, and I top deck this. I'm like, oh, I've got free mana for it, and someone's going to cast something, and I just and I refill my hand. Like, uh, you know, Frank cast Cave, and I'm like, I'm countering that and drawing five cards, mm-hmm. and it comes back around in my hand, and I can play Tower End again, and I've got three can trips in hand, and I can start rolling yep. again. Now, do you only play this in Talran? I played in my Sphinx deck as well. You do, okay. Yeah, and, I, and, and I, I count it as a draw spell. I don't count it as a counter spell. This is the equivalent of Treasure Cruise that you have. I've so tried it's never this card. Worked for you? It's never worked for me, and I believe it. I'm sure it does. I'm sure there are situations where it doesn't. I always, I've never tried it. I usually don't like playing counter spells in Commander, anyways. I, I find I hope, it just a waste of time. I always forget the creature clause, and so someone plays like a Chromos Memorial, and I'll try to Go, cast oh, it. And sure. It's like, oh, can't. Forget what you just saw in my hand. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that's why I, I always think of it as a draw spell. Okay, so I think those are the cards that we all kind of treat as our, our pet cards. If anyone has any pet cards of their own, I would love to hear them because I always find it fascinating what cards people kind of connect with and find to be ones they want to put in their deck. So feel free to hit us up on social media and let us know what your pet cards are. Um, for our sign out question today, it's kind of related to this. What's the most recent card that you've seen in a game where you're like what is that like a card that you're like i don't know what that is i and and that's probably a pet card but it might just be a weird thing that works in the deck um and i'll give you mine it it popped up last night and i guess i've seen it before but i never really thought of it um was retribution of the meek which is a sorcery for two and a white and it's destroy all creatures with power four or greater and it was in a doran deck nice and i looked it up on edh rack and it's in a lot of doran decks so it's not necessarily that obscure but I've never seen anybody play it, and you probably wouldn't outside Doran, and it's awesome in, in a Doran deck. Um, I have looked at it, and I think one of the reasons I don't play it, which I would love to get it, is this is a, it's an expensive card. It's almost $10, I believe. Yeah, for a, a Wrath when I could just be running Wrath of God or something else. Yeah, but in your Alesha deck, too, there's a lot of times it would not touch your guys either. Yep, that's where um I, think I run the four-mana one that destroy all creatures that have greater power than this creature. Yes, yep. yep. And there's also a dusk, uh, dawn to dusk, I think, or dusk to dawn, whatever it was. The split card from yeah, from Amon Cat, the aftermath Cat. card. Yep. Um, that's, that, that's similar to that as well. But I'm tempted to run both or all of them, in, in particularly in Doran. Yes. Yeah. So Max, anything from you? So I originally had a different answer, but when you brought up Luke's Animar deck, it made me change my mind. And I, any card that lets you change the color of a particular word on a card. Okay. He ran a couple of those in that deck to change the protection Animar had. Yes, I remember that. And the first time he ever did it to me, I'm like, wait a minute. Wait, <laughs> why can't I beast within your dude? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so those, I always forget they exist, and when someone plays it, it's in some tricksy deck like that. One thing nice about an Animar, too, because he has two protections, you can like, oh, no one's playing black, I can just change the black, and it doesn't, you still have the pro-white right. against the two white players or whatever it is. Yep. So, yeah, particularly in Animar, that's, that's actually a really clever play. Yeah, so cards like Crystal Spray from Invasion. It's a two man, three-mana instant where it does that, and you get to draw a card. So it's a cool cantrip and lets you save your dude. Because the original, there was Magical Hack, and there was Slight of Mind. I think there were the two originals. Yep. Um, one changed text from land, one changed like island to swamp or whatever it was, and the other one changed the color. All right, Chris, what's yours? Mine is called Spellweaver Volute. It is a five mana, three colorless, two blue, aura enchantment. Now, this is a very different one. Uh, Probably not a whole lot of people have seen this, but you enchant an instant card in your graveyard. Whenever you play a sorcery spell, copy the enchanted instant card. You may play the copy without paying its mana cost. If you do, remove the enchanted card from the game and attach Spellweaver Volute to another instant card in a graveyard. So basically it kind of gives an instant flashback when you cast a sorcery. Yep. yep. It's very different. I had a guy play it last night, and two of us that were in the game both looked at him like, what is that card? I ran it in my Talran deck for a while. 
Um, and the problem I found I had is I didn't have enough sorceries in the deck. Yep. So it's tough to trigger with sorceries. If it was like instant slash instant, it would be super, super good, at least in, in that deck. Yeah, I um, found it gross because the guy that we were playing against was he would put an instant on it and then, well, he's playing Prime Speaker Zagana, and then he'd play one of his mana ramp spells and then okay. cast an instant spell. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you need to stop this. I do not like what's going on here. And one thing that's worth noting, because I actually just had to look this up, the aura is on the battlefield attached to a card in a different zone. So you can target it. It's not like in the graveyard where yep. you can't mm-hmm. target it. It's in play attached to a card in a different zone, which is in, I don't know how the rules allow that to work, but apparently it's so it weird. Can. This, this is also one of those cards that's so weird, it will probably never get reprinted. Oh, I bet you it will never see a reprint. Because <laughs> it, it is. It's just like so not intuitive. But you're right. It's a very cool card. All right, thank you very much for joining us this week for episode 10. I am Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris.